Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and today we're going to be doing another Planet Zoo mod spotlight, right before the Eurasian Animal Packs come in, so we've just lucky we've got a full uh, pack ready of mods, which I'm really excited to get stuck into. Um, so yeah, we're going to be having a look at some of the wonderful uh, biodiversity that we have in the world, of course, I'm really excited to talk about some of these animals. And if you, for you mammal lovers, this is going to be all mammals today. So we've got a couple ungulates, we've got a couple uh, mustelids, we've got some peccaries, we've got a little bit of everything. So we're going to get stuck into this. So we're going to be starting off today uh, with the white lip peccary by Leaf and Ginger Toast. So this is kind of like a companion to the um, collar peccary that came out as the anniversary. So a couple of the, uh, the modders have kind of done the two species. But we'll start off with the white lipped peccary. So these guys are a species of peccary that's found around Central and South America. And the only member of the genus uh, Teas Teasu, I believe you say that. But um, in terms of its taxonomy, they were first described in uh, 1795 as a member of the Sus genus, so as a pig. But now they consider their own thing. And there are five recognized subspecies that live around that range. Because as I mentioned, they have quite a big range. And they were first kind of evolved probably around the Pliocene. We have a limited fossil record, but we know that they were around at least like by the Pliocene. And actually fossils suggest that they would have lived more suddenly into in uh, kind of interglacials because of the world being a little bit drier then. So lived more south uh, and based on other species they lived with and would have lived in more like a semi-arid or arid habitat around Buenos Aires, kind of that area. But we also do know that they do hybridize with uh, collared peccaries, as there's been a couple um, hybrids reported in zoos, but not in the wild, because I don't think they actually go too much together in the wild, I'm not too sure. Though their range is also pretty fragmented, they are considered vulnerable, as we'll get into. So you can see they're quite pig-like, even though they're not that closely related to pigs. They're covered in dark hair, and you can see that, and they've got a cream underside that gives them their name, the white-lipped peccary. And adults can reach about 90 to 135 centimeters long, or about uh, 35 to 53 inches, with a height of about 90 centimeters, or about 35 inches at the shoulder. And they are usually weigh between 27 and 40 kilograms, but can get bigger. Uh, and there's no obvious sexual dimorphism, but males typically have longer canine teeth. It's kind of a way that to differentiate males from females, so it's not super obvious. And they also have a scent gland, or a, uh, which is on the posterior mid-dorsal region, so kind of around here, posterior so around their tummy, probably used to like, a lot of animals, uh, especially mammals, will use those scent glands to like, communicate to each other. But yeah, really, really cool, love the white lip peccary. So in terms of the habitat, they've got quite a huge range. They could be found in Argentina, Belize, Bolivia, all those countries up until like Costa Rica, Ecuador, even Mexico and Venezuela, and is regionally extinct in El Salvador, but did live there. And they typically thrive a lot in dense, humid tropical forests, but thrive in all sorts of other habitats. They live in habitats such as dry forests, grasslands, mangroves, and dry areas like the Cerrado ecosystem in Brazil, which makes sense considering their old Pleistocene range. Uh, and they also could be found at sea level up to about 19, 1,900 meters or about 6,000 feet uh, up mountains. And their range does overlap with, a lot with that of the collar peccary. So they do overlap, but I don't believe so much because these guys are a little bit more rarer as we get into. But sadly, they have actually disappeared from 87% of their historical range in Mesoamerica. And where the critical addition uh, where they still inhabit. So that they are kind of, they're not endangered endangered like really endangered they're vulnerable because of a few threats that we'll get into but really really cool in terms of white pe peccaries they tend to live in large herds and unlike uh kind of collared peccaries uh that travel single file these guys are a lot more social they live in bigger groups group sizes can range uh from under 10 which is uncommon there's been groups as small as five recorded to as many as 300 but these really large groups are now kind of uh, rarer than they would be historically because of their decline. The average size of uh, group size in this fragmented area of the Atlantic forests was about to be 42, although herds will commonly come into contact with each other and interbreed, obviously presenting and breeding. Um, and as mentioned before, it overlaps. The overlap, overlap is significant as they're both found in similar habitats. And a study uh, actually published that the former's bite force or like the 
peccary, the collar peccaries, uh, the white lips peccaries force is actually a little bit greater than the collar peccary. That explains how they can coexist. Since they have a little bit of a stronger, since the white lip peccary has a little bit of a stronger bite force, that allows them to eat foods that collar peccaries couldn't eat. So that kind of allows them to have a different niche, which is quite interesting. So they consume different foods when living in the same area. And they can also, as you mentioned, you can, they can produce squealing noises and clack their teeth as they're running around in herds. And they can be heard uh, heard from hundreds of meters away, which is, shows that group coherence and also alarms of predators. And is common with other peccaries, which is quite cool. They can groan and moan and bark and squeal, very similar to a lot of other peccaries. In terms of feeding, they f uh, forage for food, like frequently doing so in coastal areas or near bodies of water where they'll eat a lot of fruit, but they'll also eat like nuts, fungi, invertebrates, and sometimes even fish. So they have a quite a varied diet. They consume up to about 140 different species of plants, over 30 uh, families. And while they do not frequently, they will feed on earthworms, eggs, small vertebrates and carrions, very much like pigs, very omnivorous. And they can become prey for things like jaguars and cougars. Uh, and while in large groups, they actually are able to drive jaguars away with their loud vocalizations. But um, smaller groups may become more prey to uh, things like cougars and jaguars and uh, those kind of animals. And in terms of their breeding, and while we have a look at that, we're going to have a look at the cute little babies. Look at the little, little guy. Is that a baby there? No, that's a, no, that's a baby there. I thought it was a poop, but here's a cute little baby. Little piglet. So they can actually breed year-round, and they have an extra cycle of between 18 to 21 days, and have a gestation period of about 158 days. Two young are usually born, and they're capable of moving with the rest of the herd right after their birth, so they're pretty much, uh, they, that's the term, the scientific term is precocial, so it's pretty much ready right out of the box, but yeah, really, really cool. But they are consistent, uh, considered sadly vulnerable by the IUCN, as we'll get into. Uh, they are relatively fast breeders as we mentioned but it's, their population is still decreasing and the main threats they face are things such as deforestation which is a big one and they're highly dependent on de uh, protected areas to keep the habitat safe from human activity and because this habitat gets more fragmented that means they're more at risk of getting hunted by humans and the tendency to live in large herds means they're quite easy to spot and they can kill, like, very much like, if you remember passive pigeons, you can pretty much, like, kill, like, a hundred with a single, like, shotgun shot. Since these guys live in such big herds, it's very easy to spot, and you can kill many in one go. And even light hunting can be a threat in some areas with naturally lower population densities. Though, luckily, in civil areas in Brazil, there seems to be healthy populations uh, that have become locally extinct, which is sad, but luckily there are other parts with healthy populations. And their populations have declined about 30% in the last 18 years. And think that trend is going into the future, but sadly we don't want that happening. And other things that could be disease uh, from like related animals and even like domestic pigs is probably something that could be an issue for these guys. But yeah, in terms of conservation efforts, they are protected in multiple areas, which is good. However, the, that alone might not be able to keep them alive since the habitat types are not as all the habitat types are not naturally found in. So there's going to be need a lot more uh, of protection outside of their native or uh, protected like areas. It's like you can't just pull them off because they have such a wide range and such varied habitats. Some populations just live in areas that aren't protected or not really biodiverse. So um, research as well, there's been restrictions by CITES on what you can like restrict their trade on their pelts and hides. Uh, there's also more areas of study trying to like make sustainable like populations and making sure uh, it can be done sustainably to so help the populations recover. And relationship with humans, they are hunted by both indigenous and non-indigenous resident, uh, residents in the habitat. And in terms of food, they're considered abundant, white and abundant, and are sold in rural communities with both peccaries being both species of collared and white lip peccaries being important game animals. And while they are easy to locate because they uh, they can live in herds and have loud noises, they can be quite dangerous to hunt and known to kill dogs and typically are hunted in groups. And multiple individuals can be killed. And um, Peru actually permits like uh, the sustainable hunting of uh, settlements of under 3,000 individuals a year, I think. So it's trying to like enough to like keep people going, but you're not allowed to hunt much more over that limit and they also have a scent gland that's usually removed uh, right after you kill it just because you don't want it to taint the meat uh, 
got to get rid of that pretty quick. But yeah, really, really cool. Love a nice peccary there. So Leaf and Ginger Toast did a really wonderful job, especially with this cute little guy here. And nice peccary. I can not love peccary. Really, really awesome. So next up, we've got the next species of peccary. Uh, and this one was done by Jen and uh, Leaf. So Jen uh, managed to have a look at this one. Really, really cool. So this is the Sharon peccary. So the Sharon peccary, or Tagua, I believe you say that, is the last extant species of the genus Catagynus and is found in Paraguay, uh, Bolivia, and Argentina, and is the most endangered of the peccaries, as we'll get into. Another really interesting fact about these guys is that they are really interesting is that the, they were discovered as a fossil species first. So they were found to, uh, based, described based on fossils in 1930 and was thought to be extinct until 1971, where the animal was actually discovered to still be alive in the Chana region in the uh, Argentine province of Salta. And then was well known to the Western people, but for a while it even took uh, a lot for Westerners to acknowledge its existence. So it was originally described as a fossil animal, and then we're like, oh no, it's actually like a living right now. Which is really interesting and weird, but still cool. And that's considered a great example of like a Lazarus taxon. So uh, animals that were thought to be extinct, uh, like kind of being dis rediscovered again. So a great example of a Lazarus taxon. Great examples of that's like the South Island Takahe or... Um, the bush dog is another example that lives in, like in South America. But really, really cool. And there has been some studies actually suggesting that these guys may be uh, in a genus, another genus. Um, and if accepted, the genus uh, Catagynus may actually be extinct once more. But um, uh, this one may be the Sharon Pegamy, maybe she, uh, should be a different genus. Uh, they're called Parochorelli, so it'll be something like that. But yeah, still cool. In terms of the habitat, much smaller range where these guys are from. So these guys are from hot, dry areas living with like low-lying succulents and thorny bushes. The Great Chano is about 140,000 square kilometers with a few scattered trees, but lots of like thorny scrub vegetation. And they're quite well adapted to these habitats since they have large, well-developed sinuses that combat the dust, dry, dusty conditions. And they also have small feet, which helps them maneuver through the spiky plants. And in terms of other characteristics, not too different looking in terms of uh, the other peccaries, but they are the largest of the three species of living peccaries. And they have many uh, pig-like features you see, uh, ungulate as well, very pig-like in most regards. The main way that they differ is their size, obviously their larger size, they have longer ears, snouts and tails, and they also have white hairs along the mouth, unlike a lot of other species of peccary. And they also have a third hind toe, but other peccaries only have two, which is kind of interesting as well. And uh, they've got a hypsodont teeth uh, uh, morphology, which is really interesting. And it points down with like pigs. So these guys are much more adept, uh, adapted for kind of signaling in those like more dense areas. So it's cool. In terms of their reproduction, and as we have a look, we can have a look at the cute little babies here, the little Sharon peccaries. Uh, these guys are typically born between September and December, with litters being found almost year-round, and births have been linked to periods of food abundance and rainfall. And the average number of embryos to be recorded is approximately 2.72, so about 2 to 3, you could say. And females may actually leave the herd to give birth, but return afterwards, and young are precocial, as I mentioned, that means they're ready to go right out the box, and run with their mum pretty much, like, hours after birth. And the pelt of the young resemble that of the adult, as you kind of see there, uh, as you can kind of see here. And there's not really much in terms of sexual dimorphism. So in terms of their behavior, these guys live in uh, herds of up to about 20 individuals. So smaller than white-lipped, but still bigger than collared peccaries. They're active during the day, especially in the morning where they like to travel. And herds will have a general travel cycle within their own range of about 42 days. And this allows the individuals to monitor and show ownership of these areas. And they're quite social, they make all sorts of different sounds, ranging from grunts to clattering their teeth, and they may ex uh, occasionally exhibit aggressive behavior towards each other, such as charging and biting. They are not as aggressive as other species, so they're pretty chill compared to a lot of other species. And as a defensive strategy, members of the herd may line up in a defensive wall, which makes, the, uh, makes it a hard to target for the hunters, and actually produce a milky, odor, uh, odorous substance uh, that's kind of like uh, for marking trees and shrubs and it's actually located on their backs and they typically will rub their backs on trees to kind of leave scents 
and um, frequently bathing on these guys will also defecate at particular stations, which is ways to pretty much outline their territory. In terms of their food habits, these guys have very adapted to very tough vegetation. They feed a lot on cacti, and they'll use their tough snout, snouts to roll the cacti on the ground to rub the spikes off, and also pull the spikes out with their teeth and spit them out as well. The kidneys are also really specially adapted to break down acids in cacti, and the two-chambered stomach is also well suited for these feed foods. But they'll also feed on acacia pods and cactus flowers and bromeliad roots as well, so they're really adapted to kind of those desert plants. And this species peccary sits out salt licks and uh, formed by ant mounds and construction projects, so they will kind of find uh, roads and stuff. They'll go and find that and kind of lots, uh, lick the salt, which is quite interesting. And they gain lots of really essential nutrients from these, such as magnesium, chlorine, and uh, calcium from these salt licks. And uh, sadly, as I mentioned, they're also the most endangered species of peccary. So uh, because these guys are endemic to an uh, isolated region of South America, they're the most vulnerable to human activity. As quickly as they were discovered, the numbers have kind of disappeared. Uh, herd numbers have been decreasing due to habitat loss and fragmentation because a lot of their ranges uh, is being turned into farmland, which is like big Texas-style ranches, which is very bad for these guys. Hunting also has been a big thing, and disease has been a thing as well in re more recent years. And a population luckily has been established in North American European zoos. And preserves have also been uh, established, but not highly enforced. But there's only about 3,000 left uh, considered, but still really, really cool animals. Still doing okay. 3,000 is enough, definitely enough. There's been species that are now really common that have come back from way less. So they, I think they have a good chance of recovery. Just need some good protections on them. A really, really cool animal. Another great animal done by the leaf and ginger toast. Oh, no, no, leaf and gem. Uh, that's the white left one. Okay. Next up, we're moving on to uh, another remaster, you could say. We've got the Kafule Leshwe uh, by Junoro Pizza and Gaboy, you know, the dream team. So let's have a look at you guys. Let's look at the male hair. So the Leshwe, also called the Red Leshwe or the Southern Leshwe, or this one is the Kafule Leshwe, which is a subspecies. So these guys found, uh, there's a species of antelope found in like the wetlands of South Central Africa. And they live around Botswana, uh, the Southeastern Democratic Republic of the Congo, Zambia, Namibia, Angola, and especially places like the Okavango Delta, Kafule Flats, and the Bowingalu Wetlands. Uh, the Kafule Leshways come from the Kafule Flats. And they're quite common in captivity in wild animal farms, so that's good. They typically stand at about 90 to 100 centimeters tall. And they're at the shoulder and get between 50 to 120 kilograms, with males typically being larger than females. Uh, you can see males are typically a little bit darker in color, but the exact hue and, uh, depends on the subspecies. They also have these long spiral horns going on here that are found only in males. So you can see the females aren't quite uh, ornamented, you could say, but still cool. And they have somewhat longer proportions. They've got hind legs that are somewhat longer than other species of antelope, and it can actually help them run through like marshes and marshy soil quite easily which is quite a good adaptation for them considering that's the habitat look at the cute little babies as well in terms of their reproduction these guys will mate during the raining seasons of november to february and they have a gestation period about seven to eight months so the majority of their calves will be born in july to september and although rare they have been known to hybridize with water buck uh, but uh, as i mentioned it's quite rare in terms of their habitat these guys are quite a important, uh, let me see, uh, important in wetlands. Uh, they're important in herbivore of uh, aquatic plants in these marshy areas. And they use the knee-deep water to protect themselves from predators. And their legs is also covered in a water-repellent substance, and which allows them to run quite fast in knee-deep water. So it's another way that they're allowed, able to kind of escape predators. And they're also diurnal and will gather, gather in herds that can be many thousands of individuals. Though these herds used to usually are typically only of one sex, but they will, uh, during the mating season, they will mix. So there are considered four subspecies of Lichway recognized, though there's a couple of extinct ones uh, that have been considered subspecies and are now extinct. There is the common red Lichway, there is the Kafuli Flats one, which is this one, and the Roberts Lichway, which is now extinct in Zambia, and the Black Lichway. But they're I'm not sure how well they're founded genetically, but still really, really cool and a nice animal remaster. Really, really nice. Good boy, always doing a wonderful job with these guys. 
This one is one I've covered before, but they put the rig on the Nile this way, so it basically just walks a little bit more accurate to how it probably walked in life. But yeah, really, really cool. Definitely a big fan. Next up, we've got another antelope uh, done by Monsoon. Monsoon really coming out here with some really nice mods. Well, we've got the Harola, so this is one I've been wanting to talk about for a while. So let's have a look at you. So this is the Harola. Also known as the Hunter's Harder Beast or the Hunter's Antelope. These guys are sadly critically endangered and they are a species of antelope found on the border of Kenya and Somalia. It was first described in 1888 by big game hunter and zoologist HCV Hunter and the only living member of its genus uh, Baltorus, if you say that. In terms of its description, as you can see, they're medium sized. Uh, they got like a torn color to them with like a slightly lighter underparts and a little bit of a darker back there. They've also got, you can see this kind of band of white around their forehead and this kind of dark bit to their eyes, which is an adaptation for uh, kind of uh, to block out sunlight. And they're often sometimes considered the four eyed antelope because of these four little dots. They kind of look like they've got four eyes because of their patterning and it kind of covers their uh, suborbital glands and they use those glands to kind of mark territories and things. And as they age, their coats will actually become darker. And you can see that basically all the like the horns and udders and things like that are all kind of black. Uh, and males and females actually look quite similar, though males are slightly larger with thinner horns and darker coats. So I believe this one is a male, yeah. So they, they look pretty similar, just males have a little bit longer horns and typically darker coats. But yeah, really, really cool. Got a really, really long face, you can see that there going on. And really large horns with the kind of uh, typical of a lot of antelopes. But let's look at the female. So this is a female, so they don't look too different, but you can kind of tell. Uh, several sources have actually uh, provided measurements, so we have a pretty good idea of their sizes. They get about uh, height at the shoulders about 99 to 125 centimeters, or the body weight of 73 to 118 kilograms, and head to body length 220 to 200 centimeters, and horn length 40, 44 to 72 centimeters, and things like that. And um, that's kind of what we know. So the medium sized antelope, up to about like. Uh, 120 kilograms you could say so definitely medium size but still cool in terms of a taxonomy they are in the family uh i'll say today they're related to things like harder beasts and uh, wildebeests and things like that they're in that kind of group but they are considered their own genus and split as their own genus about uh three million years ago so in the end of the pliocene pretty much and we have fossil relatives that or at least fossils of this genus around kind of like africa uh, south africa Ethiopia and Tanzania, so it's quite interesting as well. In terms of its ecology, these guys are quite well adapted for arid environments. They seem to prefer uh, arid environments with an annual rainfall between 300 and 600 millimeters, or 12 to 24 inches. They range, the habitat can range from open grassland to light bush to wooded savannas and scattered trees. And due to the arid environments they inhabit, they are able to survive independently of surface water, so that's pretty interesting. They've actually only been observed drinking on 10 occasions during the height of the dry season. And most of the uh, water that they get is from grazing and things like that, which is quite interesting. And they're also predominantly grazers, but they will browse uh, a lot. Uh, they favor grasses with a high leaf to stem ratio, and it's quite important for the diet. And do not consider the ecological requirements of the Hirola unusual, because these are more common species, we're also going to have that. Uh, there's also been uh, a vet who's like examined kind of the uh, digestive tract of Sifa Hirola, and they're well adapted for eating dry grass, roughage, and things like that. And they believe that the quantity is believed to be more important than the quality in the diet of them. And they're often associated with other species. Uh, they can live, uh, can be associated with like oryx, uh, grass gazelles, zebras, and topi, but they will avoid buffaloes, harder beasts, and elephants, uh, and they will also avoid livestock. They prefer the short grasses where livestock graze, but they typically will avoid li livestock. In terms of their social structure, female herola will give birth alone, uh, which is another interesting thing about these guys. Um, typically, they will um, be... Uh, They'll rejoin them after that time, and then these young will kind of these nursery herds that they grow up in between five to forty individuals, so they're typically seven to nine, and they're all joined by an adult male. 
Young Hirola leave the nursery herd at about nine months of age, and then they'll kind of go find either another herd to hang out in. Especially, like, males will go find a bachelor herd. Some females may join, like, another herd, so kind of very similar to things. And even they have been seen to be uh, attached to other antelopes if they can't find another herd of Hirola, like uh, Grant's gazelles, which is quite funny. And they're quite territorial. Adult males will have a territory of good pasture that can be up to about seven square kilometers, and they'll mark that with their dung and things like that. And um, it's also been suggested that low population densities, adult males abandon territory defense and will instead follow a nursery herd. And the nursery herds do not defend a territory, but they have a home range that overlaps the territories of a few males. And these, these can be between 26 to 164 square kilometers, which is quite interesting. Herolas are also seasonal breeders, so they can be found typically uh, babies around September and November. And data of the age of sexual maturity suggests that these guys' uh, gestation is about seven and a half months, or about 27, 24, 224 days. And um, one female uh, mating at about 1.4 years old and giving birth at 1.9 years. So typically at two years old is when they'll have their first baby. Another pair who rolled about 1.7. And then in captivity, the most kind of reasons for mortality when they were in captivity is kind of interherola aggression or interspecies aggression, especially between females. So that's part of the reason why they're probably not captivity anymore. But yeah, um, in terms of uh, the structure of these herds, let's find the, is that the male? Yeah, that's the male. So in the structure of these herds, they're relatively sta stable, but bachelor herds tend to be a bit more fusion fission, so they can be quite aggressive. And in 1970s, they were observed in herds of up to 300 individuals, but to take advantage of scarce but clumped resources. And then information of lacking on the male territoriality, things like that. But sadly, they're nowhere near that common now. Uh, threats have, there's a lot of threats to these guys, and it's part of the reason why they're the most endangered antelope in Africa. Uh, the reasons for their decline has been a lot of factors such as disease, like rhino pest, uh, hunting, severe drought, predation, competition with domestic livestock for food and water, habitat loss caused by bush encroachment, and the res as a result of the extirpation of elephants from their range, which is another interesting thing as well. Uh, they prefer areas that are used by livestock, which actually puts them at increased risk of tuberculosis because they like those areas. They're more common to come with cattle. They might be more vulnerable to poaching. They're also subject to natural phenomena and competitions with other herbivores, which is another little issue for these guys. When the ICN also calls them threats. So in terms of the population now, their now range is no more than 1,500 square kilometers on the Kenyan Somali border, but there is a translated, uh, translocated population in the Tasavo East National Park. But the natural population in the 1970s being around 10,000 to 15,000 individuals, there's been a 90% decline between 1983 and 1985. And the survey recently kind of found between 500 and 2,000 individuals, with 1,300 being the estimate. And the most recent estimate, a 2010 survey, so about 10, 15 years ago, the population is about 400 to 456 for roller. So they are quite endangered. There's only about 500 or so left. The translated pop population was established with uh, translocations in 1963 and 1996. Uh, these locations put 30 animals and included there was at least 60, uh, 76 Harola and then there was another bunch tra translocated and another bunch translocated. So it's believed to be by December 2000 the Harola population is about 70 individuals and by 2076 individuals. So about stable you could say. And there was some that have been fitted with GPS trackers to try and understand them and try and help with their conservation. But as I mentioned, there's only 300 or 500 in the world, so they are considered critically endangered. And their numbers do continue to decline. And there are none in captivity, so if they go extinct in the wild, they're going extinct everywhere. And um, being one of the rarest, if not the rarest uh, antelope in Africa, there's been conservation... Uh, not mean that much conservation action. As I mentioned, there's been translocated populations, but there are small sanctuaries and uh, there's a predator-proof area that's like a 23 square kilometer predator-proof sanctuary where they have a small population of Harola breeding and they're apparently breeding well in the sanctuary, so they could do well. But you could say that's technically captivity as well, so they're technically being captive bred, but they're in a predator-proof, so it's just a little area that they can live and breed and uh make sure that they can survive but yeah really really cool very interesting animal very very cute little babies nice roller so monsoon i think really did a wonderful job with this antelope really really cool so next up we have got 
by Gaboyan Monsoon once again. We've got another really interesting animal I've been wanting to talk about for a while. We've got the Taria. This is its name. Very interesting animal. So the Tara, these guys are omnivorous uh, member of the weasel family that are native to the Americas and the only species in the genus Alira, I believe that's the name. They're also known as the Tolomuco or Pariso Lingo in Central America. They've got a few different names across their range, which is quite interesting. And they're considered least concerned, so they're not too worried about uh, population decline. So I imagine we'll go into that. Uh, in terms of their body shape, you can see they've got quite a long and slender body with a body type actually quite similar to that of a fisher or a marten, though with a build of like a smaller and sleeker wolverine, you could say. They range from about uh, 56 to 71 centimeters or about 22 to 28 inches in length. That does not include their 37 to 46 centimeter long or 15 to 18 inch really butchy tails you can see there. And they weigh between 2.7 and 7 kilograms or about 6 to 15 pounds. With males being slightly larger and more muscular than the females. As you can see they've got quite a short dark coat as well but there's a lot of variation. They can have like a... Uh, also, they have a yellow to orange heart shape on their chest, as you kind of see going on there. But there is variation. You're going to get lighter variations. They can be much paler, grayish as well. And there's quite a few variations in the game as well. You can get like albino and white and pale white individuals. Uh, although not as rare as uh, in Taras as, long, as much as other species of muscolids. It's actually quite common in these guys. They have been found. So there's lots of variation uh, in the game that's been represented as well to help reflect that these guys are quite colourful in real life, which is cool. Uh, another thing as well, their toes are actually of an equal length uh, with tips that are strongly curved that are held together. Oh, what are you doing there? Um, these claws are actually short and curved, which are well adapted for climbing and running rather than digging, so they're quite well adapted for climbing. The pads are also hairless, but are surrounded by stiff sensory hairs. Uh, so they can kind of feel that around and they also have short rounded hair uh, ears long whiskers and black eyes with a blue gray sheen and they also have anal scent glands but they're not particularly large in taras and they're actually not as pungent as a lot of other species like skunks so they're pretty pretty nice smelling or not as stinky as a lot of other mustelids like i've smelled ferrets and otters and otters are the worst because otters they have the fish smell and then they have the mustelid stinky smell and it's the worst thing i i don't like otters uh poo at all i don't like cleaning it but i'm used to it now it's all good <laughs> um range and habitat these guys are typically found across south america east of the andes except for uruguay east of brazil and the most northerly parts of argentina so they're quite a wide range and there's currently about seven subspecies described but i'm not sure how accurate that'll be but they are typically found across a lot of those habitats, like subtropical and tropical rainforests. They typically like those, but they may be found crossing into grassland to try and find uh, between forest patches. And they also inhabit kind of cultivated areas and croplands sometimes. Look at these cute little babies. Let's see if we can talk about the reproduction. So these guys typically will breed year round, with the female entering estrus several times each year between 3 to 20 days at a time and unlike some mustelids they do not go through their embryonic diapause so they do not pause the development of their embryo and gestation lasts typically from about 63 to 67 days and a female gives birth to one to three young which she cares for all by herself uh, the young are born attritional, so unlike being precocial where they're ready to go right out of the box, these guys are not that well developed. They're born blind with closed eyes, but they're already covered with a dark coat of black fur. They, when they're born, they weigh about 100 grams, and their eyes will open about 35 to 47 days and leave their den shortly after that. They begin to take solid food at about 70 days of age, and then are fully weaned at about 100 days old. Typically, hunting behavior begins as early as three months for these guys, and the mother will initially bring her young uh, wounded or slow prey for them to practice their killing on. And then once they reach fully, uh, fully grown age at about six months, they'll leave their mother and establish their own territory at about 10 months of age. So in terms of their behavior, these guys are actually diurnal, and they're actually only occasionally active in the evening or the night. And the social behavior is not that understood. Though they are considered uh, solitary, they may have been seen in larger groups, like with mother and her large offspring, but other than that, typically by themselves. They're also quite opportunistic predators, so they'll feed on rodents and other small mammals, as well as birds, lizards, the reptiles and invertebrates, and even climbing trees to get at fruit and honey. And also, they locate this prey typically by scent, 
as they have quite poor eyesight or relatively poor eyesight and actively chase it once located rather than kind of using ambush tactics. As I mentioned as well, they're also expert climbers and they use their long tails to balance them as they climb. On the ground, they'll, uh, or in large horizontal kind of tree limbs, they'll use a bounding gait to move at high speeds. They also can leap from treetop to treetop when pursued. Though they generally avoid uh, water, they can swim uh, rivers if necessary. And they typically will live in hollow trees or burrows on the ground, with individual animals also maintaining a territory or a home range of up to 24 square kilometers. And many will travel up to six kilometers in a single night, which is quite interesting. And in terms of uh, caching, they'll of the actually seen they'll pick up unripe green plantains, which are inedible, and then lead them to ripen in their cache to eat them. So they come back after a few days and eat the softened polyps. So that's another really interesting thing about these guys. Really, really cool. And I have to say, the babies are really, really cute. Where's the other baby? Where's the baby? There's the baby. There is the baby. Look at this little guy. The little, little, little goober. But yeah, in terms of their population, they are shrinking, especially in Mexico, due to habitat destruction, like in most other species. But they are typically considered least concerned, since they have such a wide range and are still relatively common. Uh, it's just they're naturally declining because, you know, we like, we're like chopping up the Amazon rainforest. So that's going to cause some declines. Look at this little baby here. Look at the little cutie. So yeah, a really awesome mod. I think uh, Gaboy has done a really wonderful job. And... Jorno's done a really great job coding it, as per always. Another banger. Always another banger. But yeah, really, really cool. Definitely a big fan. And a cool animal I'd have, I've been wanting to talk about for a while. A little weird mustelid. But yeah, cool. Next up, we've got another one. Another little mustelid. This one was done by a new modder that's called Great Cakes Mod. And I do love myself some great cakes. And hopefully this is a great mod as well. And we can see it is a pretty good mod. This is the European Pine Martin. So also just known as the Pine Martin. They are also a mustelid. They live in most of Europe, uh, parts of Asia and the Caucasus, around uh, parts of Iran, Iraq and Syria. And I consider least concern. So in terms of their size, these guys you can see, typically light brown fur uh, and dark brown with kind of a lighter underbelly or yellow underbelly. And I've also got like a little bit of a bib going on. You can see that here, like going on. And they typically have a short and coarse coat during the summer, but they have a longer one and that's silkier during the winter. They also have that cream bib, as I mentioned, and their body gets to about 50 centimeters long, or about 20, uh, 21 inches, with a bushy tail that's about 25 centimeters, or about 9.8 inches. They typically weigh between 1.5 and 1.7 kilograms, or about 3.3 to 3.7 pounds, with males typically being slightly larger than the females. And they have an excellent sense of sight, smell, and hearing, so quite well adapted for hunting and all that. And these guys typically prefer to inhabit uh, wet, uh, woodlands, so they like well-wooded areas uh, with lots of trees to be able to climb. As I mentioned, they were quite well adapted. I was going to mention they're quite well adapted for climbing. Uh, in Great Britain, they've been common in Scotland, and they used to be more common, but of course, because of uh, people, we've shot them. Uh, they were long considered ex extinct, actually, in uh, England. But there has been some relic populations believed to be discovered. There was a DNA test that that there's a relic population somewhere. There's some DNA, it's just quite interesting. And then 2015, there was a uh, confirmed sighting of a pine martin in England, which is over a century in over a century, which is really interesting. And they put out camera traps as well. There was a, a in September 22, there was the first pine martin to be seen in London. So uh, they've been seen in like, camera traps. So it's, it's interesting to see that they're spreading or doing a little bit better now. Uh, I'd be really cool to um, set the quite cryptic species. Cool to see some reintroductions and a lot of rewilding stuff going on in Europe. It'd be cool to see these guys becoming more common again. There's also a small population in Wales, and they're considered quite rare in Ireland, but typically in the rest of Europe, they're doing pretty well. It's just those areas because uh, Ireland and the UK are such, have been such uh, or so modified by people these guys are quite rare in those areas, but luckily they are bouncing back, and a lot of the rewilding efforts I don't doubt are helping, so that's good. Really interesting about these guys as well, they're the only mustelid with semi-retractable claws, so that means they are, uh, allows them to climb better, it's very similar to cats, and that allows them to climb and run better on tree branches, and they're, although they're relatively quick runners on the ground, they are mainly active during night and dusk, and you can see they've got those small, rounded, quite sensitive ears, 
uh, and sharp teeth that are well adapted for eating all sorts of small animals, such as small mammals, birds, insects, frogs, and carrion. They've also been known to eat berries, bird eggs, fruits, nuts, and honey, so quite generalist in that regard. They're also quite territorial, and they'll use, uh, they mark their home range with feces, and their scat is typically quite black and twisted. In terms of the recovery, uh, the actually the recovery of the European pine marten in uh, Ireland has actually been credited with the reduction of the population of the invasive grey squirrels. And with the range expanding and the uh, pine martens kind of meet the grey squirrel, the populations have been quickly retreats and then the squirrel, uh, red squirrel population recovers. So that could be a great thing for rewilding because invasive grey squirrel is a bad thing. We want more red squirrels, which are a native uh, animal in the UK. So bringing these in, they'll hunt the grey squirrels and then we get more red squirrels. That's kind of what we want. Uh, and because of this, they uh, because the grey squirrel spend more time on the ground than the red squirrel, which covered with the pine martin, the grey squirrels pretty much become easier prey than the red squirrels. So more pine martins means less grey squirrels, more red squirrels, and the world's a better place. That's really really cool. Well, at least in the UK, the UK is a better place. Uh, I would I wouldn't feel the same if grey squirrels uh, were the ones that were declining because of the invasive species. But anyway, in terms of their lifespan. They've lived up to 18 years in captivity, but the maximum age of uh, living in the wild is only about, like, 11. And with three to four years being more typical, they reach sexual maturity about two to three years of age. And copulation will usually only occur on the ground and can last more than an hour. The young are typically born in late March. Let's see if you can find the baby. There is one baby. We need to find it. Where is the little baby? Let me see. Oh, there it is. It's so tiny. It's really hard to see sometimes. There's the little baby. A little bit of a cutie. Um, mating occurs from July to August, but the fertilized egg does not enter the uterus until seven months, uh, for about seven months. And the young are usually born late May or early June after a month-long gestation of the implantation of the eggs. That's delayed implantation, as I mentioned. Uh, they typically will be uh, in litters of one to five. Young pine martens typically weigh about 30 grams at birth, and the young will emerge from the den about seven to eight weeks after being born and disper disperse at about 12 to 16 weeks after their birth. So in terms of predators, these guys, large uh, animals will prey on, especially young individuals, but adults too. Uh, things like wolverines, red foxes, golden eagles, uh, white-tailed eagles, goshawks, and eagle owls will all prey on uh, these guys. But as I mentioned, they've got such a wide range that can be found pretty much most wooded areas across Europe and into Russia and even parts of like uh, the Middle East. You could say like the Caucasus, so they're doing quite well. It's just in Europe where they've declined, so I mean the UK where they've declined so much. And it's really cool. So... In terms of uh, the threats to prime martens, they are considered least concerned, but of course humans are the biggest threat. And because they conflict with humans because they uh, arise from petty control from other species, they are vulnerable and also livestock as well, as uh, been thing as well. They prey on livestock and, uh, and they use inhabited buildings for denning. So they actually do benefit a little bit from humans a little bit, though they are affected by the wood loss as they're well adapted for off course climbing and less trees means less places for them to hunt also prosecution has uh, been a big thing as well like illegal poisoning or shooting and habitat fragmentation is a big thing this causes a decline in the european pine martin population though they are doing okay for the most part as mentioned they're least concerned in some areas they are prized for their very fine fur so the areas where they're actively hunted and in the uk they're often offered full protection luckily and that's probably helping them recover a little bit so yeah really really cool so yeah, really, really cute little guy and really nice mod. Uh, I really like this guy. Really, really cute. So nice to see the Pine Martin. I know everyone's wanted Pine Martins because they're so cute. And we do love funky mustelids. But um, yeah, great cake mods. Their first mod did a wonderful job. I would like to see more in the future, of course. Nice to introduce a new modder into the scene. But that is not our last animal for today. And our last animal is something we've been waiting for for a while. So this one's kind of a really cool, interesting, extinct animal. We've got by Monsoon, we've got the Eurasian Aurochs. So a really, really cool animal here. The Aurochs, really, really cool. So the Aurochs, or Boss Primogenus, uh, these guys are an extinct cattle species that are considered to be the wild ancestor of all modern cattle. And um, quite big. So they're typically found, Aurochs is German or Celtic words for wild ox. And kind of the it's kind of ones from German or Aurochs, which is interesting. 
In terms of its taxonomy, they were named by Coronelaeus Box Taurus for the scientific name Feral Cattle, and then Boss Primogenus was proposed for the Aurochs and described the differences. But we and now actually know that the Aurochs is the ancestor of all modern cattle, which is quite interesting. That typically considered three species or uh, subspecies of Aurochs. There's the Eurasian Aurochs, or four, depending on who you ask. There's the Eurasian Aurochs, the Indian Aurochs, and the North African Aurochs. So Bos primogenus primogenus is this one, the European Aurochs. There's Nomadicus, which is the Indian uh, Aurochs that lives in the Indian subcontinent. The North African Aurochs, or Matricianeris, which lived north of Sahara. So that's pretty much like the Mediterranean one. Though there's arguments that can that have said that they're pretty much like the just the European one, just living in North Africa. And there's also a dwarf population that comes from the Greek island of Caretha, which is quite interesting. So uh, most fossil evidence suggests that these guys kind of evolved around, I believe, let's say, like the Pliocene. Uh, so these guys would have been around the Pliocene kind of about 2 million years ago. That's kind of the oldest one. There's the ancestor of the Aurochs kind of about 2 million years ago. So it would have evolved around the Pleistocene. And the earliest Aurochs we have in Europe is about... 23,000 years old, uh, 230,000 years old, and um, these guys actually seem to have hybridized a lot with the steppe bison and the European bison as well, with having up to 10% ancestry from uh, the aurochs as well. So there was a lot of interbreeding since they're all in the same genus. The bison is um, mostly considered boss now, so that's why they're um, quite closely related as well. And fossils have been excavated from the Indian subspecies around like South India to the Middle Pleistocene. And they lived right up to the Holocene. With the, I'll talk about the extinct, their extinction soon. But right from the Pleistocene up into the Holocene. So a very long history and a very interesting history as we'll get into. So in terms of their description, a lot of this is based on descriptions like 16th century. Uh, they were considered to be pitch black as you can see with a line down their back, a grey streak. With carvings and stuff uh, and also lots of paleontological reconstructions and things like that have trying to given us this reconstruction of an aurochs uh remains of hair have not been found until the early 1980s and the search that north african aurochs would have had this light saddle mark down their back uh calves would have probably born as you can see with that chestnut color there uh, and the young bulls would have been changed to black with a right white eel stripe going up like that and you can see both sexes have a light colored muzzle and, but evidence of variation in coat color does not exist, though there probably was. E Egyptian uh, patterns actually show cattle with like a reddish brown coat in both sexes as well. And but those could be more primitive cow breeds, which is interesting as well. In terms of body shape, they are very different, as you can see, in shape from a modern cow. Uh, most of the differences, they're strikingly different. Their legs were much longer and more slender, as you can see, a little bit taller. Uh, they get to about 1.8 meters tall at the shoulder, which is quite a bit taller than modern cattle. Um, they've got stronger, longer legs. Um, they've got uh, the larger horns that are much larger and more elongated than domestic cattle, other than like those really, really weird ones, like uh, like the Texas Longhorns. But this is most cattle breeds, you could say. I've also got much uh, stronger shoulder. You can see much bulkier shoulder, things like that, and have a larger forehead and things like that. Quite similar to the Wizent in a lot of ways. They're, they're obviously, as I mentioned, they're not that closely related, but they didn't breed. Uh, these guys are quite interesting. And in terms of size, these guys were one of the largest, just a little bit smaller than the Wizent, one of the largest herbivores of Europe at the time, of the, of the Holocene. Uh, so these guys uh, varied regionally, and as I mentioned, there was a dwarf population. These guys typically got between 155 and 180 centimeters tall, uh, in places like Denmark and Germany, at about and in bulls and about 135 to 155 in cows, and while aurochs in Hungary were a little bit smaller, they reached about 160 centimeters. The African subspecies as well was quite similar in size to the European aurochs, but declined in size during the transition of the Holocene. And then you have body mass as estimates as uh, some individuals reached about 700 kilograms, or about 1500 pounds. Uh, those in the late to middle Pleistocene got up to about 1,500 kilograms, or up to 3,000 pounds. And they seem to have quite considerable sexual dimorphism. As you can see, there's a big male here. We'll have a look at the females. This is what the female looks like. And luckily, the mod also shows off that coat color. There's lots of different variations within that coat color, I'm pretty sure, which is quite cool. 
as I mentioned, you can see quite big horns. So this is probably better to show off in the male, but you can see the female has quite big horns as well. They had quite massive horns, reaching about 80 centimeters, or about 31 uh, inches, with a length between 10 to 20 centimeters, or about 39 to 7.9 inches in diameter. And you can see it kind of grows sharply as you can see, go, ooh, ooh, which is quite interesting. The curvature is more strongly expressed than the horns of cows. But you can see the males are just larger in general, with the largest kind of horns the largest chinese specimen is about 48 centimeters uh, horns as well and some cattle breeds today still show that similar horns shape to uh, some modern cow breeds like the spanish fighting bulls they're quite a primitive breed which is shows that very similar to the aurochs kind of shape but it occasionally individuals derive these as well in terms of their habitat, these guys were widely distributed across the world. They lived in North Africa, Mesopotamia, up through the Caucasus and Western Siberia, and then in Finland as well, and up like pretty much right into uh, China as well. So pretty much across Eurasia. It's quite a wide range. And they had quite a delayed extinction, as we'll get into. So fossil horns have been found at like, the Tibetan Plateau at about like, 3,400 million years, uh, 3,000 feet, I mean. And um, most fossils from China, like lower plains, things like that, there have been fossils around found in the Japanese peninsula as well. So as I mentioned, a really, really big range across from Europe, North Africa, into the Middle East, up through like Tibetan Plateau, and into China, and then even to uh, the Japanese archipelago. And these guys typically liked riparian and wetland forests, so they liked dense forests, especially in Europe. Uh, they, but they would have lived in, of course, a variety of different habitats. They would have lived in shrub habitats as well. Temperate grassy woodlands and plains they would have liked. And especially warm areas, they would have lived in open country or forest margins. And there would have been competition with livestock and humans generally, uh, as the aurochs kind of um, was bigger and it competed with them. But of course, they declined over time because people were probably hunting them as well. So in terms of their extinction, they had quite a delayed extinction, as I mentioned. The first subspecies to go extinct was the uh, Indian aurochs, which became extinct during the Indian uh, Indus Valley civilization due to habitat loss and, um, and caused by interbreeding with domestic zebu, which are descended from the Indian aurochs and more like obviously people grazing and, and pastoralization or pastoralism as well. And the last remains of a, uh, Indian aurochs is about 3,000 uh, 800 years ago you could say which is the first species subspecies to die out the african aurochs survived until the roman period as we have them in Colosseums as well and they lived around uh the nile delta as, as indicated by fossils and the last one this is the saddest one the european aurochs or the type subspecies the type subspecies primogenus lived in southern sweden up until about seven thousand years ago and then will decline more and more and more. The last known fossil from Great Britain is about 3,000 years ago. Probably went extinct about 3,000 years ago. But they kind of declined. They were still quite widespread in Europe during the Roman Empire. And widely were actually used as battle beasts in Colosseums. Because they were big and aggressive. Excessive hunting actually did still become a thing though. And went ex nearly went extinct. And then they gradually went extinct in Central Europe. And concurrent with a lot of other. With the like clear cutting of forests during the 9th and 12th centuries. And then by the 13th century. They really only existed in Eastern Europe. Uh, which were hunting became a privilege. So if you were nobles. You can still even go hunt your orcs and the royals and the population hungary actually declined until the 9th century and went extinct in the 13th century and finding of sub fossils actually suggest they may have survived in transylvania between the 14th and 16th century but um they kind of were still declining 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 and the sadly the last population the last known aurochs herd lived in a marshy woodland in the Jaskolo forest in poland and declined around about 50 individuals uh, to from the mid 16th century and in 1601 it was down to four individuals with the last aurochs cow the last wild one dying out in 1627 uh, from natural causes so it's kind of sad like an animal with such a big history and you know this ancestor of modern cattle has declined a lot and went extinct in kind of such a delayed fashion and it's because we just didn't we had the ability to like conserve it and as i mentioned we already kind of did we like let it only became uh, royals were the privilege to hunt them, but we could have easily prevented their extinction, but we didn't, which is a little bit sad. But um, in terms of ecology, we know a little bit, at least we know a lot about like historical accounts about their ecology and things like that, but really, really cool. Uh, they formed small herds, mainly in the winter, but typically lived singly or in smaller groups during the summer. summer. 
Their social behavior may have been quite similar to modern cows. They would have been gained through displays and fights with uh, both cows and bulls engaging them. And with the Hypsilont door, these guys were very much grazers like modern cattle. And had a food selection quite similar to domestic cattle, which means they would have competed with domestic cattle. Sorry. Feeding on grasses, twigs, and acorns. So we'll talk about the little babies here. Let's talk about the little babies. So mating season was around September and calves were born in spring. And rushing bulls had violent fights with an evidence from the jackalow forest. So that they were fully capable of mortally wounding and potentially killing each other. And in autumn, they typically fed in for the winter, uh, kind of gaining weight. During autumn, they tried to get a shiny coat, things like that. And calves stayed with their mothers until they were strong enough to join and keep up with the herd and feeding groups. They would have been quite vulnerable to uh, predators such as grey wolves, uh, brown bears. and their, But their immense size and strength of adult aurochs kind of protected them from uh, those kind of animals in that forest at the time. It was mainly the young that were more vulnerable. But during prehistory, the lion and tigers and hyenas would have been prey for the they would have been prey for them in prehistoric times and maybe even uh like cave lions and things like that may have potentially preyed on them and of course uh, apparently from historical descriptions they were quite aggressive uh if provoked but were generally not fearful of humans which means they probably helped with since they were not fearful of humans that would probably help people domesticate them but they were aggressive when provoked and they were swift and fast and quite aggressive but yeah, really, really cool animals. So you're not loving aurochs. Definitely a big fan. But yeah, in Asia, there have been lots of cultural impacts of these guys. Uh, as I mentioned, there have been lots of depictions. There's like a million, middle Paleolithic layer of kind of site. There's been aurochs bones cut. They were obviously hunted. And then there's been lots of depiction of them in like art around like uh, the Indus Valley era. There's like seals and stuff that have aurochs on them. And as I mentioned, they are the ancestors of Cebu, which is the Indian cattle. In Africa, uh, there has been art of them, and in, especially in Europe, there's been art of aurochs, especially if you think the famous cave paintings in the uh, La Crosse Cave. They have uh, depictions of aurochs, and throughout, uh, from, pre, from pretty much prehistory up until like the Greeks and the Romans and the 16th century, we do have like medieval paintings and stuff of aurochs. So there's lots of aurochs depicted in art and stuff, and so they're probably quite important for Paleolithic and even like Roman Empire people, as I mentioned, they were used as battle beasts. So they're quite important historically to like people across, uh, throughout pretty much most of human history. So that's really interesting. And in terms of domestication, as I mentioned, the earliest known domestication of aurochs is about 9,800 years ago to about 7,500 years ago, or like 7,500 BC. So aurochs bones have been found that are larger in size than the cattle bones of later Neolithic, so it's very likely they were about that time, maybe about 10,000 years ago, these guys would have been domesticated. The first kind of modern uh, European cattle or boss taurus, you know, the taurine cattle, uh, probably around 10,000 years ago, and then spread across, across and things like that. And they would have hybridized uh, a lot of male aurochs as well until about 1,000 years ago, pretty much. And there's evidence of them interbreeding. As, as I mentioned, pretty much uh, uh, our modern cattle are just domesticated aurochs. And there was hybridization pretty much until they went extinct. And there's some genetic variation, things like that. The Indian aurochs is thought to have been domesticated between 10 and 8,000 years ago. And uh, they would have became the zebu, uh, pretty much. Uh, they would have actually contributed to the gene pool of the zebu until about 4,000 years ago with pastoralization in northern India. That means pretty much when they went extinct, sadly. So we can see that they were still, even as they were domesticated, wild aurochs would have been contributing to the gene pool until they went extinct in the areas where they were breeding them. And it has been thought to be a third domestication event in, uh, in, in uh, North Africa. But it seems to uh, not be much in terms of uh, genetics in that regard. So mainly the two main populations domesticated were the Indian population, the Dominicus, and the primary genus, the European population of aurochs, were domesticated. Well, let's look at the babies for a little bit. Why not? Uh, and But that doesn't mean they're extinct. So like we can, they are extinct in the technical sense, but they do live on in modern breeds of cattle. So... There has been attempts to breed back a lot of the traits of these aurochs and kind of quote-unquote bring them back from extinction or create an aurochs-like breed. So we pretty much have aurochs, you know, a second aurochs coming back, which is quite interesting. 
I was going to say, we'll have a look at the baby. Look at this little cutie. Um, so in the early 1920s, uh, Heinz Heck, who was uh, part of like called Hitler's zoologist pretty much, they initiated a breeding program to breed cattle to look like the aurochs and result in the Heck cattle. And herds of these were released into the Osvartisplassen in the 1980s to kind of uh, replace that ecological role that aurochs had, you know, big grazers. And... Um, while the heck cattle do not actually look much like aurochs, they kind of did have that kind of, um, you could say, like, look to them. But there has been more serious attempts to try and bring back the aurochs. There's the Uruzis project or the Taros project that have been trying to bring back a breed of cow by like breeding primitive breeds and breeds with traits of aurochs to try and create a, a kind of a aurochs breed that pretty much looks exactly like uh, wild aurochs and while this isn't bringing them back in the way as we're like bringing back a cloned aurochs like we talk about with mammoths and things you know you're not cloning them per se what you're really doing is just creating a breed of a uh, cow that looks like an aurochs and it may be functionally and ecologically like an aurochs but it's not going to be an aurochs because it's not descended from that population it's just a cow or domestic cow that has been pretty much re-engineered to look and act like an aurochs so you're not bringing it back from extinction technically but you're still getting the benefits of an animal that looks and acts like an aurochs so it's a little bit complicated but still really interesting and i support those projects because aurochs were a very important animal both culturally to europe because of you know people love them also historically uh they were pretty important for the ecology being a big herbivore and there's lots of people breeding them back mainly for like uh research and pretty much rewilding trying to bring back a large herbivore to help turn up the habitat and create more open areas and help make europe more biodiverse and aurochs or or these breeds will have a big place in that which is awesome and yeah, and also just, I love the look of Aurochs. I really hope to see one that really succeeds and brings back that phenotype. Maybe even get some, because we do have some preserved genetic material from Aurochs. Maybe even breed in some, uh, like, cloned Aurochs and breed them in. So you could really create something that's really interesting. I think that would be really cool in the future. Aurochs are just so cool. And I really wonder what they would have tasted like. I imagine they would have tasted like, you know, normal cow, but with a gamier taste. And that sounds really nice to me. So I know that's a little bit morbid, but I'd really love to bring back like that kind of Aurochs and try it. Because I love myself a good steak. And now I'm imagining a steak with like a gamey flavor. I think that'd be really, really awesome. So yeah, enough talking about Aurochs. And I think uh, Monsoon really did a wonderful job bringing us this wonderful animal. Uh, with all the beautiful color patterns that it comes with and everything. And yeah, so I think this is a great place to end the video. So um, yeah, thank everyone, you know, Monsoon, Gaboy, Genora Pizza, Leaf, and everyone. Uh, great cake mods, uh, great job at a first mod. Really love to see more from you. But yeah, great work to all the modders. Really, really awesome selection today. And great to get this out before the Drayton Animal Pack. So um, we're going to be covering that over the next week or so when it comes out. So yeah, really, really awesome. So um, yeah, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to get the little bell icon to get notified about anything. So yeah, if you guys enjoyed this video, hope you guys like and subscribe, and bye-bye.